invite you to open up your Bibles with me. This evening's scripture will be Psalms 139, verses 13 through 16. Psalms 139, 13 through 16. I'll be reading from the New King James Version. For you formed my inward parts, you covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret, and skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Your eyes saw my substance, being yet unformed, and in your book they, were, they all were written. The days fashioned, me, fashioned for me, when as yet there were none of them. We continue our series tonight of Science in the Bible, and next week will be our final lesson in that. We'll be moving on to some other topics on, on Sunday nights. If you have any paintings in your house that are original, and even, I guess, some copies as well, then you can probably look in the corner of one of those, of those paintings and you can find a name. That name is the painter the person responsible for the creation of, of that work of art. In Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1, it says, In the beginning God created. So the Bible begins with God's signature. His signature upon that which He created, because God is the great designer and He is the great creator of this world and all that's in it, and indeed the universe, and all that is in it. But I can tell you that atheists don't care. Atheists don't care what Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1 says, because they do not believe in the Bible, and they do not believe in the God that wrote the Bible. And that's a problem. When I was in North Carolina, we lived right on the edge of the Research Triangle. We, the congregation I was at, we lived pretty much right in the middle between UNC, Duke, and North Carolina State. We had a number of professors. We had a large number of people that worked in the science field in the research areas there. And there was a number of them that at times came across, and there was far more than probably we'll ever see in Smith County, atheists, people that simply do not believe in God. And, you know, it was an interesting discussion with those people as we talked about their discussions with people that were atheists. Because you can't approach an atheist like you do a person that believes in God. You know, the lessons that I've given up to this point, I pretty much used scripture in all of them, shown uh, from an evidence of God's word as to what we believe and what is true and right. And you know, I can show someone God throughout uh, the Bible if they believe in the Bible. But how do we do that when they don't care about a book, chapter, or verse? When they don't care about what we hold so very dear. And it doesn't mean that they're mean. It doesn't mean that they're hateful or anything like that. Some of the conversations that members of the congregation I was at was having, they were with people that were truly interested, people that were honest, but for whatever reason, they didn't believe in God. They were nice people. And so, you know, we, we may run into those people. And we can't necessarily pull out our Bible and establish God because I don't see that as a standard. You know, how do we prove that God exists to atheists and evolutionists that do not believe He does? Like God Himself, that is, well, that's just an enormous subject. So tonight I want to show you just one small way to hopefully show the existence of God to those who do not believe in the Bible. Something to maybe crack the door open for more discussion. Because sometimes that's all we're trying to do is to get another opportunity for another discussion and continue that discussion until uh, you know, maybe they begin to see that truly there is a God and that He created this world. There's a book that I have 
I've had for some years now, and it's called In Six Days. And within this book, there are 50 chapters, and each of those chapters are written by a prominent scientist who at one point in their lives believed in evolution and were atheistic in their mindsets. And yet through their own studies, their own work in the science field, came to believe that there was a designer to it all. Came to understand that the the tenets promoted by evolution of accidental things could not explain what's going on in this universe. Now, I want you to understand that of those 50 people, I'm not telling you that they all believe in God. They don't all come to that point. They didn't make that leap always. But every single one of them came to an understanding that they believed in design and that there was an intelligent design to this universe and to this world. Um, And so, you know, some of them come at it from that standpoint. One of the men that wrote in this book was a Dr. Jerry Bergman, and he was a biologist. And he talks in his chapter about irreducible complexity. And it's, a syst- it's where a system or a machine will not work with the removal of a part. In other words, you have to have every part for it to work. You know, there's a point on your car out there that if you remove a certain number of parts, you're going to reach a point where the car won't run anymore. And so there is a point in every vehicle or any machine that you reach a point of irreducible complexity. Any more things removed from it, and it ceases to function. And every machine has a minimum number of parts required to operate. Now, Dr. Bay, he, he references a Dr. Michael Bahey, who wrote a book called Darwin's Black Box. And in that book, Dr. Bahey said that there are five pieces to a mouse trap. Now, folks, this is as simple as it comes, and yet it is something that has yet to be refuted. There are five pieces to a mouse trap. And a mousetrap will not work without every piece. You have to have a flat wooden platform to act as a base. You have to have a metal hammer to whack the mouse (laughs) when it gets set off, right? You have to have a spring that will bring that hammer down. You have to have a sensitive catch that releases the hammer when slight slight pressure is applied. You have to have a metal bar that holds the trap, the hammer, until the trap is sprung. Now, there are some out there, and you can, you can look out there, and you can find people trying to work their way around this. And one particular man wrote on, on a particular side online, he said, well, there, you, can, you don't have to have the wooden base. You can connect it to the floor. No, see, you just changed your base. It's still a base. you still got to have it. It may not be a wooden plank, but you've just made the base the floor. And so you haven't removed a part. You've only exchanged one thing for another, but it's still the same. And this brings us to what we call the teleological argument. Some people call it the watchmaker argument, that when you have something as complex as a watch, it demands that someone made that watch, right? Someone designed, someone made, someone put together that watch for it to work with such precision. Order and complexity demand design. And design demands a designer. And even atheists admit that design, even atheists will admit that design demands a designer. If something is complex enough to need a design, to have a design, it has to have a designer to have designed it. If you have a poem, you have to have a poet. If you have a novel, you have to have a writer. Evolution is about more than just individual parts. We need to understand that. Evolution is a fusion of parts. A fusion of parts over eons that, according to the theory, come about strictly by accident. It would be the equivalent of throwing the mouse part, mouse trap parts onto the floor or shaking a box with them in it and somehow them falling and landing and being perfectly put together as a mouse trap. That's the kind of, of odds that we're looking at here. That's the kind of magic that you've got to have to make evolution work. But it's more than parts. Sir Fred Hoyle, one of Britain's prime, uh, prominent scientists, argued that the chance of higher life forms emerging accidentally is com- comparable 
to the chance of a Boeing 747 being constructed as a tornado goes through a junkyard. That's the same kind of odds that you got to enable life forms to evolve. Irreducible complexity then shows design. Design demands a designer. And the mousetrap is so simple. And we see irreducible complexity in it, but yet we see it in far more complex things. I mean, that mousetrap is a simple thing, but there is things that are far more complex than a five-part mousetrap. I want us to think about just a couple tonight. There is irreducible complexity in the human body. David stated in Psalm 139 and verse 14, I will give thanks to you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your work and my soul knows it very well. David looked at his own life and said, I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. He talks about God knowing him even when he was still in his mother's womb when he saw his unformed substance. When we go all the way to the very smallest part of our being, the very smallest part of what makes us who we are as a human being, we go down to the cellular level, right? And we have a hundred trillion cells in our bodies. And they all function under the same rules and regulations. If they don't, then we have illness. They all function. Each cell has its own power production. Each cell has its own waste disposal. Each cell has its own purpose. The nerve cells in your body transmit signals from your brain throughout your body and to your brain throughout your body. Your red blood cells carry oxygen. Those are not the same two cells. But yet they work together as a part of the human body. DNA in a cell is the blueprint for how a cell is constructed and what function it will carry out. A single cell contains enough information to fill 1,000 books, 600 pages long. That's in every cell of your body that information is. All the information and material necessary to make all 6 billion people in this world could fit in an aspirin capsule. The complexity of cells would defy the possibility of a cell evolving its different components over time. Because that itty-bitty cell needs every component for it to function as a cell doing whatever its function may be. Their irreducible complexity is clearly seen in that you cannot remove or wait for parts to evolve and that cell still function and serve the body. But then that takes us to another level, doesn't it? That's just a cell. So a cell cannot do without its parts. It can't wait for parts to evolve or to come along as your DNA seems to decide that you need help and so you evolve whatever it is. All those hundred trillion cells that you have in your body then work together as an incredibly complex system. And that's your body. Something that also requires fully formed parts and something that also shows irreducible complexity. Your body can't wait for your brain to form. Your body can't wait for a heart to evolve. Your body can't wait for lung cells to figure out how to take oxygen from your blood and to transport it throughout the body. Your body cannot wait for your liver to decide how to do what it does. It cannot wait for your stomach to form so that you can now eat and receive nutrients from that which you eat. You cannot wait for your eyes and your ears if you're, if you're going to be able to function through sight and sound. You cannot wait for reproduction to form if the species is going to continue. Each of these parts individually even in their own complexity. If we broke down and we took the time tonight to look at each one of those, we're going to find that every single one of those parts have an irreducible complexity to them as well. The heart won't work without parts of it that have to be there. The liver won't, the lungs won't, whatever you want to do, whatever you want to list. Needing their parts to function within themselves and within the whole body together shows an incredible amount of design. They could not wait. 
They could not wait for millions and millions of years, which is what evolutionary scientists are going to tell you you need to get to where you need to be. In that genetic accident that will suddenly make you something that you needed to be all along. Irreducible complexity. It shows design. And design demands a designer. So we see it in the human body. But we also see irreducible complexity in nature. I'm only going to give you one example. There's a, there's a bunch of examples we could use. I, I just, I'm not going to belabor the point. But I mentioned to you a couple of weeks ago about the bombardier beetle. And I think he's maybe one of the more interesting ones to think about. Uh, just simply because of how bad he would have suffered if he was waiting to evolve everything he needed to evolve. You know, he has three structures in his body. In his abdomen, there are glands that produce hydrogen peroxide in his body, or in his abdomen. He has a combustion chamber in his abdomen. He has glands that produce a catalyst to mix with that hydrogen peroxide, which, uh, if you don't know, that's also used as rocket fuel. And he puts those things together when a predator comes near and they are combined and ejected from his body and they explode upon hitting the air and they have a temperature of 212 degrees. And it'll make an audible pop. You know, evolution would have left a lot of beetles without abdomens, right? Oh, we're going to mix these two things together and there goes one, right? I mean, you can't wait for all that to form. You can't wait for all that to figure out, okay, it's not working the way it's going right now, so we're going to have to form something else because beetle after beetle after beetle is going to be killed by the combining of these things. That body is made so perfectly for that one simple defense mechanism, and it shows design. And it is an example of irreducible complexity in the natural world. And if it shows design, it demands a designer. You know, these arguments are, are difficult uh, for the atheist. In fact, some atheists really kind of have come to the conclusion that they believe in this, you know, that there has to be some kind of design. But they don't want to go to God, so they go somewhere else. And personally, I think they, they go somewhere else far more absurd than the thought of going to God. They say aliens came. Yeah, I heard this one, haven't you? They're making movies. <laughs> you see it on TV, but it's also in science. Aliens came and seeded the earth with life. That's where it came from. They designed it. They made it. Well, see, that's all well and good if you want to talk about life here on earth, but if there are aliens out there seeding planets, I've got another question. Where did they come from? See, you still don't answer the question. The question still goes back to where did it all begin? How did it all begin? And how did it all become so designed? if it was all by accident. So their, their solution to bypass God doesn't work. But they realize that they've got problems when you think about these things such as irreducible complexity in the complexity of life in this world. You know, it says in the beginning God created. David says we were fearfully and wonderfully made. For us here in this room tonight, that's enough, isn't it? I don't really need anything else. I don't need irreducible complexity arguments to, to go there, but they're not in a building like this tonight. And as we take the gospel to the world, as we try to bring God, an unknown God, to many people, as Paul did in Athens, we're going to have to come with arguments that will help them to hopefully find God. I'm not saying it's an easy task because it's not. And really, when you're dealing with people in that kind of a world, you're in for an uphill battle. But they, God still loves them. God still wants them. And He wants us to do our best to teach them about Him. You know, we need to always remember that wonderful are God's works. And the complexity of those works shine bright, showing us that He is the designer and that we are His creation and we are of a wonderful design. You know, Paul told the Romans that 
they really were without any excuse because all you had to do is look around and you saw God. His creation says there's a God. And so when they chose not to retain God in their knowledge there in Romans chapter 1, he says you're without excuse. There's no way you can deny him with all that he has shown simply in his creation, not to mention in his love and what he has done for mankind. As I thought about this, you know, last week I, I told you I kind of struggled in how to go to an invitation from dinosaurs. There wasn't a, a lot of paths out of that. But you know, when we think about the gospel, there is an irreducible complexity to it. There are things that you cannot take out of the gospel and it remain the gospel. The minute you do, it stops to function in the way that we want it to function. Faith, obedience, love, devotion, conviction, forgiveness, grace, prayer, kindness. I hear brethren, I hear preacher friends of mine, and they argue whether grace is more important than faith or faith is more important than obedience. And I say it's all meaningless distinctions. You're just sitting there arguing about nothing. Because let me tell you what, without faith you're lost, without obedience you're lost, without grace you're lost. It doesn't matter. Because you can't take any of those things out. There is an irreducible complexity to the gospel. There is an irreducible complexity as well to the plan of salvation, isn't there? Sometimes we use the example of plan of salvation as like a phone number, right? You don't dial all the numbers. You don't get the call. It doesn't go to where it's supposed to go. Well, that's irreducible complexity in a, another simple way to put it. Those things that God has commanded us to do, to believe in Him, to repent, to confess, to be baptized, can't take those out and still be the gospel of Jesus Christ. To live faithful. Can't take that out. And if you are taking any of those things out, if you are taking a life of faith out, if you're taking living for God every day as you should out of the Christian life, you're no longer living the Christian life. Because there is an irreducible complexity to it. And it can't be reduced anymore. Because God has given it exactly as He wants it. And there's a design to it. And it comes from our divine designer. This evening, if we can help you in response to that, to live by that, to find the salvation that's found in that, we want to help you. Why don't you come as we stand as we sing?